only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We've got a phenomenal show planned for you guys this evening. We're going to be speaking with Dr. Stephen C. Hayes. So if you struggle with anxiety, panic attacks, self-defeating thought patterns, or if you're looking for ways to actively improve the relationship to your thinking and your mind, this is going to be a show that you want to hear. So sit back, grab a drink, and enjoy this conversation. The Human Experiences in Session my name is Xavier Katana. My guest for today is Dr. Stephen C. Hayes. Dr. Hayes is a psychologist who has spent his career analyzing human language and cognition. He achieved his PhD in clinical psychology at West Virginia University, and he is currently a Nevada Foundation professor in the behavior analysis program at the University of Nevada. Dr. Hayes is the author of 44 books and over 600 scientific papers. He's ranked by Google Scholar as among the top 1,500 most most cited scholars in all areas of study. Dr. Hayes, it's a pleasure. Welcome to HXP. Really happy to be here with you, Xavier. So I'm, I'm really amazed by this book, Dr. Hayes. I mean, you've outdone yourself. I ripped through it. Um, I, thought, I thought it would take me some time to read this book because... It's about 300 pages or so, but I really, really enjoyed the read. So before we get there, though, let's let's start with a little bit of your history, who you are, how you got into this line of work. Um, tell us that. Uh, give us a little a brief you know, introduction about who you are and what you do, please. Well, if you'd asked me that early in my career, I'd say, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm interested in uh, cognition and trying to help people. But early on in my uh, academic career, I developed a panic disorder, which gradually took away almost everything over about a two or three year period. And in that experience, it really challenged me in terms of what am I here for? What am I up to? And I had to have that sense of almost losing everything before I could find an answer to that question. And uh, what I found was uh, on the other side of the panic, and maybe we can talk a little bit in the conversation about a liberated mind as to kind of how that turn was made. But what I found when I turned towards the anxiety itself was um, a person who had watched domestic violence in his home and had made an early decision that I'm going to do something about it and felt at eight years old completely inadequate to that. Hmm. And I kind of suppressed those memories. I kind of I knew them. I could have said them. And so, you know, I think at the beginning of my career, I would have answered that question the way I said, but really what I was up to was trying to build my Vita and get grants and be famous. And, mm-hmm. and I think really the person that you're talking to right now, um, you know, what I'm up to is trying to make a difference in the lives of those who suffer and empower people to turn towards what brings meaning and purpose in their life. And the thing that's different, maybe the one thing that's different is I was enough of a geek scientist when I really walked through that transformational process myself. Mm-hmm. I did a couple of randomized trials. I quit early on. I mean, the idea that you'd turn towards, you know, Eastern ideas in the early 80s. Mm. I mean, there wasn't the John Kabat-Zinn's out there to hold your hand to kind of walk you through it. You know, there wasn't <laughs> the Lena hands. There wasn't, you know, it, it, it was a very different world and... I was enough of a hippie from California to know I was now in the strange land of 
you know, Eastern traditions and the kind of things my entire generation explored. Right. And so what I did is spent almost 20 years really in uh, almost invisible, trying to get down to the processes that lead to these life expansion type moments. And we came up with this core we call psychological flexibility. And then finally I wrote it up right around the turn of the century. And it's now, you know, it was 310 randomized trials, 3,500 studies on it, and an entire community around the world, tens of thousands of people, millions of copies of ACT books that are out there. And so, and what's out there is this simple story of the 20% that maybe can do the 80%. And that's what I try to put in the book. I tell that personal story, the science story, but then I also try to reach out to the people who are reading it and Hmm. lift them up mm-hmm. you don't have to get there through anxiety depression etc all you need to do is show up as a human being and these processes are relevant to you and to the people you love and that's what's in the book right yeah i mean i i love that there's so much that you went through in that little introduction that was supposed to be brief but i mean i i love your story and i, I love how much how committed you are to this research and it really does seem like you are, you know, devoted to helping other people with their struggles. And it, it kind of began with your your own, you know, your own challenge with this. I mean, it, your own personal challenge with this. And, and it, it started, what, with your own anxiety attack, would you say? or? Yeah, I think the real gut check was when I started having panic attacks. My first one was in a department meeting watching full professors fight, as I say, in a way that only wild animals and full professors are capable of. Uh, but uh, it touched something. I didn't know it was touching, but it, uh, you know, I, I raised my hand to just ask them to stop. And by the time they turned to me, three or four minutes of fighting later, I literally couldn't make sound come out of my mouth. I sat there like a, you know, like a goldfish going, bah, bah, bah. and I, you know, I'm an untenured assistant professor sitting in this room and just humiliated. So my first panic attack was, you know, terrifying to me and humiliating. And, and I did, if you actually know people who've had panic histories, when you visit it and you realize how far anxiety can take you, down in terms of your ability even to do the simplest thing functionally like make sound come out of your mouth right you know the natural human thing to do is to watch out for it scan for it fight it hide it try to minimize it all of which just feed it I mean, you it's just like you had a baby tiger and you're feeding it chunks of meat and you're waiting for it to go away and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually it wants to eat you. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened to me. Over a three-year period, I got down to the point where I couldn't get in front of five undergraduates and give a lecture. I mean, I would have to show them films. Uh, if somebody called me and asked me to give a talk, my graduate students gave that talk. And I'd tell a story about what a wonderful mentor I am that I'm <laughs> promoting their career. And yeah, that's the ticket. Uh, but... It turns out you can't run fast enough to run away from your own history. Oh. And um, thankfully, uh, I, I didn't find a way out, but I did find a way in. And it's an ancient way. I mean, it's in all our wisdom traditions or spiritual traditions. But what Western science can do, not of disrespect, but it can pull it at its joints and do things that you can do in minutes that can put on the factory floor, things that maybe are a little bit of what's inside, even what, you know, monks and meditators and folks have been doing for thousands of years. Not that it's a substitute for it. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we need to be there for people in many different ways. And maybe Western science is an important way, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's many places that I could start here. But let's start with something that you mentioned. You uh, you mentioned ACT, and um, that that stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. So, I mean, this is, and, and then also RFT, which is relational frame theory. So what is, what is different? I mean, first, it was RFT that you coined first and then ACT. And what, what is the difference and what do those mean, please? Well, uh, RFT is the basic science of cognition. ACT, which also means acceptance and commitment training, so because you can do it with sports and business and things like that. And you can put it inside the healthcare system with the word therapy, but... Really, what we're dealing with is just how the mind works, and that's relevant 
everywhere. It's relevant right now between you and I. It's relevant to the people listening to this. So you don't have to have the T word be therapy. It's also uh, training. But uh, act as a set of methods that use uh, acceptance and mindfulness processes and, and commitment and change uh, processes together to produce what we call psychological flexibility. But underneath it, in that 15, 16 year gap where we did the early studies and then we went silent as far as outcomes, because mm-hmm. uh, I didn't think I should just kind of rush out the door and say, hey, you know, some of the stuff monks have been doing for thousands of years is probably a good idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to pull it at its joints and put it out into the world in a, in a different way. And part of what I wanted to do is understand why is the mind like that? Sure. Why does it work like that? Sure. And we've tried. I'm out of the behavioral tradition. I'm kind of a, a probably some ears will close when I say this, but I'm kind of a neo Skinnerian, and I really respected what he did, B.F. Skinner, if you know. But from Rats to Walden too is what I respected. You know, this kind of visionary. Can we get tight principles that would take you all the way up to being able to organize communes? Okay. Do an old hippie. And, you know, Walden, too, was so exciting, you know, that utopian novel he, he wrote. But he didn't figure out language and cognition. And within the behavioral wing, we've tried for 300 years to make association work. And if you want to understand what that is without getting too geeky, think of it like chalk on one hand, you put it on your other hand, and now the chalk's on the other hand. Uh-huh. Association has to do with time and place, bringing things together, or... They're similar in form. They have the same color, the same shape, the same smell, something is similar physically. That's it. Okay. You can't build a model of mind that way. And we've tried and tried and tried. And what I instead, I could propose, and I might even use the word discover. If there's anything you'll get me to say that's self-aggrandizing, it's probably that sentence. Is that, no, the mind is organized the way your family is organized. Mm. It's organized by relationships. Mm -hmm. What difference does that make? Well, here's the difference. If I imagine, let's say your right hand is a toxic thought or a memory or an emotion, I could imagine that, you know, if I could just coordinate off, then it wouldn't rub off on my left hand, which might be my work, my relationships, you know, my sexuality, my peace of mind. I I could imagine I could manage that. Mm -hmm. Well, but what if it's like this? Imagine a picture of a big family and they're all related, but you don't uh, know who this new person walking in the door is related to. Okay, okay. And I tell you, that's Susie's second cousin on the mother on her mother's side. You now know the relationship between everybody. Okay. And that person. Okay. And if you do the math on it, you have things like. You start getting pages of zeros as to how many possible relationships come with the tiniest little input. If you think of your mind more like you'd think of a picture of your family. Mm-hmm. And you're going to clean that mess up? Really? You know, mm-hmm. if you come in, let's say, with, oh, don't think that, think this, you now have created hundreds of thousands of new relationships. Mm-hmm. And you can't manage that. You take anything that anything that's important to you and let's just take this one one that you like i bet you can find things about that that you don't like sure yeah of course so you have two minds and about everything and it's vast and it's moving and it's even happening in your dreams i mean even when you're not thinking about it these things are moving around or like you know active families of spiders all weaving their web so what we brought to the vision is a we can use that to increase intelligence to work with kids who don't have a sense of self to do really wonderful things when you understand how the mind works but the other thing is instead of trying to clean it up which in the behavioral and cognitive behavioral tradition that's what we've tried to do you know detect the irrational thought dispute it challenge it change it instead we better learn the tools to put your mind on a leash Hmm. to notice your thoughts without getting entangled with them to not have them dominate and dictate to you, so that you have some flexibility as to which kind of thoughts are worth your next life's moment's Mm -hmm. attention Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. And that, it turns out, is vastly safer and more effective than detecting, challenging, disputing, and changing that gets you to focus on things that are already hard, you know, goofy thoughts you have, scary memories you have, etc. I'm not saying don't think about it. I'm saying think about it, learn from it, 
and then attend to what's of importance. And that formula is a powerful one and turns out liberates people uh, in every domain in which they apply it. So, okay, let me let me try to unpack this. I mean, that was quite a lot. So, I mean, your brain is at any given moment creating these relationships at all times to things both good and bad that are happening within your cognition, within your active uh mind at all times like so it's so whether you think something bad or good it's it's kind of copying itself and you're moving through this sort of process that is is always creating this these relationships is, am i yeah. close to this right now so yeah so the better way to kind of get uh using your analogy a leash around how we're going to control this is not to affect the thoughts themselves but our, affect our relationship to how we're going to let that thought determine the next thing that we do or how it's going to affect the next thing that we choose to think about yes although little asterisk once that is possible then it is safe i mean you can push into creative new thoughts etc we want new thoughts it's not like the form of a thought doesn't matter but it's it's almost like, for example, if somebody's afraid of a territory, let's take take me as an example when I was struggling with panic. You know, I was doing relaxation tapes, of course, what, what I do. I was doing cognitive therapy, of course, that's the way I was trained. Well, yeah, but uh, there's this phenomenon called relaxation-induced panic. And here's, huh. uh, here's the way it works from the inside out. Oh, I'm doing a lot better. Yeah, yeah, that tape must have really worked. I'm feeling really calm. I, w I was nervous last week in the same situation, but now, oh, what was that? Was that a little, did my heart just skip? Uh, now I'm feeling, a, uh, oh, God. But now I'm, <laughs> how far away is the door? What, what, uh, boom. Right. You know, so I actually got to the point, literally, I I'm a, understand I'm a clinical psychologist, I'm trying to do therapy, where if somebody said the word relaxed, I would get anxious. And then if they said the word emotion, that would remind me of the different kinds of emotion, and then I'd get anxious. And then if they started talking about their body, I'd get anxious. And, and you know, eventually, all roads lead to Rome. Hmm. You know, we can do it right here, right now. You want to play? Just do a little Oh, my God. Thing. Okay, yeah. Put me on the spot, man. Let's go for it. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's just take um, a common phrase. Mary had a little... Lamb. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm going to say it again, but this time, Xavier, it's really important that you come up with something that doesn't have anything to do with lamb at all. It okay. isn't related to it in any possible way, okay? Okay. And everybody listening, give it a shot, okay? okay. Mary had a little... Podcast. Awesome. Okay, now here's the problem. I'm going to say some words. Hot. Cold, right? Sure, sure. Black. Yeah, we're going to the opposite white, right? Podcast. Oh, just sitting at home alone. <laughs> <laughs> you see the problem? Yeah, yeah. It's a lamb? Y yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I like that. What? We only did it once. I should have done it twice to cement it in. I am guarantee you some of your listeners got to lamb. And, you know, you look at OCD or things like that. You know, when you try to suppress and push out, You've created a new relationship. Now, it's a relationship of is not a or is different from or is opposite to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's still a relation. And it'll remind you. So that's the difference between association and relation. And it gives us an appreciation of how to program the mind. We've done wonderful things with that inside the research community that we've built. But also, man, how hard this thing. This is, this is like a fractal, you know, just kind of drawing pictures on its own with this little formulas being <laughs> repeated 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 and it has a life of its own mm -hmm. you literally will see it in your dreams you'll see connections emerge in your dreams and you didn't do that just you noticed it so uh, it, it's good it's wonderful it's a lot of where our creativity comes from mm -hmm. but it's hellacious when you start applying logic to a process that's psychologic. Mm -hmm. hmm. Wow, it's incredible. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it really reflects in the stuff that you've written about, and it, I mean, it really is uh, resounding. And I'm not sure, you know, how much 
Western medicine or Western therapeutic mes- medicine, um, Western psychology is really adapting, you know, this model that you've created or you've discovered. Um, but there's, you know, there's one thing, uh, one of the main things that you talk about in your book, which is uh, something that you, that you call pivoting. Yeah. So, so what is the, the process of pivoting? And, you know, like, give us the example of that and the definition of that. Sure. Well, I, pivoting is this concept. It's more recent inside the, the act work, but that inside our struggles is a yearning. There's something we deeply want. We may not even know what it is, but you can do the research to find out what it is. And a lot of that research has been done. And so part of the message is, you know, when you're doing the most screwed up thing that you can think of, it's not because you're a bad person. It's not because you're broken. It's not because you're damaged. It's because you're a human being and you're doing the logical, reasonable, sensible, pathological thing. Mm-hmm. And and you're, the problem isn't what you want. It isn't what you yearn for deeply, not superficially. I'll un- unpack that. Okay. But it's the solution itself that's the problem. And the metaphor of a pivot, the pivot is, you know, the pin and a hinge is the, the French word for it, is that you actually are able to move in a positive direction more readily if you have movement in a negative direction. You know that from dancing. If your partner's moving this way, you can swing them around that way. If they're standing dead still, you know, it's like, get moving, you know, because, you know, we can't play together unless you're moving. Right. Well, you're moving when you're suffering. Right. You're moving. It's just you have the wrong solution for the right problem. And if we can take that energy and and note it and see what it is and then learn this counterintuitive kind of twisty flexibility alternative that's inside the research that I walked through in a liberated mind, you swing that energy in a new direction and very quickly, I mean minutes. You know, when I went through my panic attack, my bottom one where I think I'm having a a heart attack and it's two and three in the morning and I'm sitting there, I'm, should I call the emergency room? You know, I have to call, you know, I have that voice within saying, you can't drive in this condition, make the call, you're dying. Mm-hmm. And I had all that, you know, the weight of my chest and blah, 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 blah. And somewhere in there, I realize I'm not having a heart attack. I'm having another panic attack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in that horror that I couldn't even trust my own freaking body anymore. Wow. You know, I'm sitting there literally with tears coming down my face. You know, I caught that there was a voice telling me to to run and fight and hide. Mm-hmm. I think it's the voice we all have. It's that critical, I call it the dictator within. Right. That critical finger wagging. You're not doing it right. You're not on level. You have to earn your way in. What's the matter with you? You'll be okay if, but you're not there yet because that voice and i said out loud i don't know who you are but apparently you can make me hurt you can Mm -hmm. make me suffer Mm -hmm. but i'll tell you one thing you cannot do you can't make me turn from my own experience you can't do it and i stood up inside a promise that said never again i'm not going to run from me Well, the reason I tell that story is there's a pivot, and I'll unpack it in terms of quickly, in terms of what it is. It's a simple kind of pivot. Okay. But within, I mean, really, this sounds kind of weird, but I'd say within 60 seconds as I stand up, I know my life is different. I just know it's different. Because... I saw something that was 180 degrees from what I'd spent three years chasing. And so here's, what was the yearning? What was I trying to do? Well, I think one of the yearnings there was I was trying to feel. And I tell the story in there of, of you, I mentioned earlier, you know, the domestic abuse in the home. And of course a kid would try to run away from that. You, there's nothing you can do with it. You can't step in between your parents when they're hitting each other or threatening to. Or when dad's drunk or and so I just hid under my bed and cried, but I'm not eight anymore. I'm twenty-eight or thirty-eight or you know, at different points in my life where this has been relevant. But that night on the carpet, I'm in my thirties. And you know, running and hiding under the bed isn't needed anymore. But what is the yearning? I would say it was the yearning to feel. And what I've been trying to do is feel only good stuff. 
But eventually that means you can't feel at all. And you just sort of try to live life with you. It's be like if you made your fingertips numb mm-hmm. so that you wouldn't feel the sandpaper. Mm-hmm. Then you can't feel the silk sheets. You can't feel your lover's face. You know, you, you lose so much right. by that move. Right. And so if we take that yearning to feel and instead doing what the mind says, which is, I got a solution, only feel the good stuff. Mm-hmm. Feelings don't come packaged that way. Because right inside your love for your child is the fear that maybe something harmful would happen to them. You know, right inside your love for your parents is knowing that they're going to die. I mean, if you walk through anything that brings joy to you, you know now where your vulnerability is, where your woundability is. That's what that word means. In other words, where you can be hurt. So if you don't want to be hurt, uh, you got to be numb. Mm-hmm. That, and the happy numb is not happy. So... What we do instead with that pivot of acceptance, that's the one of the six, we take that energy that you're going to feel and you spin it around to, instead of doing what the mind says, you can only feel the good stuff. How about if we do this other form of feeling good? Feeling good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not feeling good. Feeling good means eventually don't feel at all. We've actually seen this in the research. It's pathetic. You start running from sadness, you're sweating from anxiety, you have to run from joy. Do you know that people who run from anxiety cannot feel joy and sit inside it? Very quickly, it has to be de- detuned hmm. because it's a threat. The bigger you are, the harder you fall. Maybe you'll be betrayed. Maybe they didn't really mean it. Maybe you'll fail later. Yeah, it's a success now, but, you know, your mind tells you that. And so the concept of pivoting, for one thing, is just to validate that we're doing our best, but we're trying to manage this evolutionary mismatch with our problem-solving symbolic mind. And could we instead find what the energy is, what the yearning is, and move towards a way of satisfying that that's real. And science there is helpful as heck because you can just do the studies and there's some ways that trick you into a little bit now and less later. And there's others where a little harder now, but a lot more later. Uh, let's do the second one. Hmm. Wow. I mean, there's there's so much to, to go through and just that as you were speaking, you know, there's so much in myself that, I'm processing about the way that I handle my own, you know, scenarios of anxiety, of panic, and, you know, when I feel nervous or, you know, and uh, something that I've been reading lately is, I wonder what you would think about this, is this method that sort of talks about facing the fear, you know, like accepting, sure. accepting it and moving into it, moving through it, and really allowing yourself to feel the entirety of it. What do you think about that? I think that's awesome. However, we have some pretty good data on this that in order to do that, you need a set of additional flexibility pivots. Why? Because I'll give you an example. I bet you some people, I'm, I bet you you're not one, Xavier. I, I know you, you know this. Heard what you just said to say, okay, if I face my fear, my fear will go away. And when my fear goes away, then I'll be able to live a more flexible and useful and uh, vital life. Hmm. No, that's not what that means. Mm -hmm. It means if you, because, and it's right in our language, we have to get through it. We have to get beyond it. We have to get over it. No, you don't. You have to get with it. It's in your history. It'll show up at other times, maybe, or maybe not. Let's find out. Let's let the future decide that. But meanwhile, can we open up and feel fully and without needless defense and then have the skills when your mind says, oh, I can't. You can thank your mind for the help. Notice that the language uh, organ inside your head is doing its job. You probably don't need that help from him because it doesn't know how to feel. It just knows how to problem solve. Right. Say, thank you. I've got this covered. I'll do the feeling part. You do the taxes part and the fix the car part. You know, you do the you know, deciding on the investment part. I'm going to do the feeling part. The same way, you know, what are you opening up to the world of emotion for? What's the purpose of it? 
And my guess is, is that you're yearning for some sort of self-directed meaning. You sense that in those emotions you have is a history that might really be useful to you in knowing how to navigate your relationships, your challenges, your job, and enrich it and kind of ground it. Well, then we better get that in. What is this What is this in the service of? If you don't do that, the mind will say, I know what's in the service of, getting rid of fear. Well, now you've got two messages. Let's get with the fear in order to not get with the fear. Mm-hmm. No, it's, you're, it's conflicting. you're fighting with yourself. Right. So what's in the book is, yeah, we walk through, and I resonate to the, t- the one you raised very much, we walk through it, but because we've done the science geeky stuff as to how they all fit together, we have a pretty complete set. I mean, there's other things you can add for sure, but this set works, and we've done the studies to show if you pull out any of the elements of the set, it doesn't work as well. It's like six sides of a box. If you started just taking sides of the box away, by the time you got one or two out of the box, you barely have a box anymore, and it's all floppy and soggy-like. So... Could we gradually assemble what we need to be able to do what you said in a healthy way? And the book would walk through that. If, if you're into what you just said, that's awesome. The book, uh, Liberated Mind, will help you in that. Because I don't care about whether you call it act or not. I mean, that's not the point. That'll all be forgotten. <laughs> but can we put processes in people's lives that matter? Mm-hmm. Put it in the culture in a way that your children's children will have it, even if they don't know you had anything to do with it? That would be cool. Okay. Okay. So, Doctor Hayes, let me let me pause you a little bit. Let's 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 change gears a, a little bit. I, I want to talk about you know something that you mentioned, and I mean I want to talk about the previous understandings of like psychology through Freud's work and Jung's work yeah. and and you know Maslow. Like, what were those people doing right, and what were those people doing wrong? Well, the ones you mentioned were what they were doing right is they would not accept minimization. They would not uh, say, oh, it's only. You know, I only want, I don't want to hear the rest of the sentence. If you want to talk to me about human complexity and say, it's only, stop at those words because I know what's coming is is reductionistic and minimizing. And, you know, my hero, my original hero in psychology as a high school student when I decided I was going to be a psychologist was Maslow. And what I loved about him was the peak experiences, is the idea that psychology could be about something more than like, you know, solving mental health problems. It could be about orienting us towards a life worth living. Hmm. And, you know, but, but, or and, Maslow said, yeah, but to do that, we can't just use the normal methods of Western experimental science. I think that was a mistake. I know why he said it. I even agree with him for the era, but we didn't have a good way of thinking about and studying the mind at the time. Mm -hmm. So what people were doing is treating everything simply as overt behavior, like non-human animals, period, end of story. And that's actually my tradition as a neo-Skinarian. But, and that was wrong. That was just wrong. And, And so his pushback on Western science methods of a traditional sort and wanted to go more into qualitative methods and things like that. I don't think was enough of a good science filter for knowing what works and what doesn't. Freud, the same way. And, you know, Freud made the decision early on. So much of what he wrote about was just awesome. I mean, it's really cool. And it and it has held up some of it, some of it. Mm-hmm. But when he made the decision early on, we're going to vet my methods by uh, the clinical case study method. You know, so... You know, little Hans said to his mum, would you touch my whittler? <laughs> and that meant that he had a secret, you know, mm. you know and then the glasses he was afraid of reminded mm. him oh, that was on the horse, the blinders on the horse reminded him of the glasses of his father because his father would have gone after his you know what if he knew he was interested in having mum touch his whittler. Sure. You know, oh, please, it could be right. But you're not going to get – so the concern I had with those is that they're just – they don't give you tight processes. They orient towards human experiences. They require analysis, and they're, they're cool sometimes, and they're misdirect sometimes. So you can't get to the 20% that does the 80%. 
you end up with lots of things that turn out to be not that important. And so they've had a hard time standing up to the modern era of show me with data. Mm -hmm. Almost too much. I mean, I really kind of weep for what's happened to some of our humanistic traditions that I feel so attached to and appreciative of because they were helpful to me when I needed it. But um, what so what I've tried to do, not just me, you'll know from the book that I'm telling a science story that's about a whole community. And I've spent a lot of years trying to empower other people to step forward and to try to kind of lead from behind. And that community has dug down into some of these issues of human complexity in a way that if you get a Freudian or, a, you know, somebody out of the Maslow tradition to come and do some act training, uh, they leave smiling because they feel as though, yeah, this is the real deal. This is human complexity. These folks are really trying hard to do it without any, this is just, or that's only sentences. And um, so I, I think Western science at its best can simplify without reducing and minimizing. And that's the, the game I want to play. Hmm. Yeah, it's I mean, it's really fascinating to hear your perspective about, you know, what's what history has said and, you know, how that's transformed now uh, to where we are now. Um, you know, so for someone who's struggling with with something like this, like what what would you give them as an example to do like what would be what would be something that you would do to give someone uh you know a practical way to move through or out of you know an anxious place well let me give an example of one of the other pivots which is that we come in i think just even before human language wanting to understand but once you get language going by the time you're three you know do you know the data of this with children on the schoolyard, preschool and kindergartners, what do they fight about the most? And you might think it'd be, oh, who gets the favorite toy? Or the, no, no, it's who's right. You know, no, that was Mickey Mouse. It wasn't Donald Duck. Who was Donald Duck? I mean, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, just go to your staff room and listen or go to, you know, we're still doing it. We just grew up. But uh, that dominance once language gets going and it's so important we need to teach ourselves to think consistently you kind of know if you do a multiple choice test and you don't know anything about the area good test takers can get above chance levels on anything because they can see if i answer it this way the next question has to be answered that way and you can kind of you know look for the coherence does this make sense hmm. yeah um yeah. well Here's the thing. If the, it's like a big spider web, you're not going to get coherence that way. So could I take uh, – I, I wrote over here a little bit, didn't I, Zara? No, no, it's, it's, no, it's okay. Please keep going. Well, if you take something like somebody who's suffering with anxiety and they have a thought like, I'll never be able to function normally. Hmm. You know, and their heart sinks and – it fits so much of the data. Look, I've struggled for years, and it simplifies things. It's coherent. As soon as you do that, your cognitive world starts changing. Do you know you start filtering out even what your sensory system gives you? So wait a minute. So what exactly are you doing in that moment? You're buying into a particular thought that organizes thousands and thousands of bits of data into a coherent set. And, it, and so now you've got a confirmatory bias. It's going to be easier to see data that suggests that you're never going to be able to. Uh, okay. You're going to be buying into that story, and you want to be right. After all, mm -hmm. you're smart. You should know your own life. And you start actually defending it. So no, it's like a cognitive it's bias that proves exactly. what you're thinking. Yeah, it's like a mindset or concept bias. and. That, and, and then once that happens, it becomes almost self-perpetuating as a life of its own. It becomes like a little core schema and it starts sucking things like a black hole of other thoughts get pulled in. And Okay, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to do diffusion. And what that is is taking the yearning for coherence, finding a way to take that language monster that metaphorically is like the words, you know, I'll never be able to 
live a life worthwhile. If you wrote it on your hand and put it right in front of your eyes so that that's all you could see, mm -hmm. metaphorically, that's the situation we're in. And what we'll do is you use methods that will take your hand and kind of push it out two feet out in front of you. It doesn't go away. It's still there. It's in your history. Mary had a little pop, 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 podcast. Right. And there it is. Sure. sure. But so you can see changed. other things. Right. Yeah. So it gives me a it's different still, perspective on. Yeah. It will change your relationship to it. So let me give you a practical example. I know it sounds goofy, but just try it. Sure. sure. If somebody's struggling with a thought like that, distill it down to a short sentence. Think it again on purpose. Notice how it punches you normally. And then let's do this deliberately to the tune of happy birthday. Oh, no. Sing it. <laughs> Just sing it. Just trust me on this. Okay. Mentally. Okay. Unless you're a good singer. Is even <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Not there. But, okay, I yeah, I understand what you're saying. The, the end of that song, this hand that's right in front of your face will be at least several inches out. Hmm. Okay. And no, you can't walk around singing off your goofy thoughts, but it's one <laughs> of about 300 methods that have been written about, and many of them studied uh, word repetition, distill it down to a single word, say that word over and over again for at least 30 seconds at about a rate of one per second, that fast. Huh. By the end of 30 seconds, that thought will have significantly left less believability, and it'll produce less distress takes you 30 seconds to try it. Hmm, yeah. And be careful. On, or, or here's another one. Um, say the thought in a funny voice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. You know, if it's, uh, you know, I'll never be able to live, uh, maybe uh, Donald Duck could say it. <laughs> I'll never be able to live. <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. <laughs> Well, and when I do this with clients, and when I even I talked about this in one of my TEDx talks, I finished with picture how young you were when you suffered with thoughts like that. Really take the time to picture what you looked like from those school pictures, etc. Mentally put that little kid in front of you. Take this scary thought you have that you're really being punched hard by, whatever it is, and listen as that child says it in his or her little voice. As young as you can go when you still had thoughts kind of like that. Mm -hmm. And listen. And then look at, what does that pull from you? And my guess is it doesn't pull wanting to slap the kid or tell him to shut up. I mean, things you would do to the person in the mirror in an instant, you would never do. Mm -hmm. And so, do you deserve less? You know, bring... So this these things are not ridicule methods, these diffusion methods. They're... Pry the monster off your face, put the dictator within on a leash so that we can have this wonderful symbolic tool without letting it have us. Yeah, yeah, I love it, love it, love it. I mean, it's it's such a great, just simple way to reframe what's going on in your brain. And I think it creates enough in, of an interrupt, like a pattern interrupt, that it will you know change your thinking or at least the way your brain is processing all of all of that sort of neurological you yeah, know, you know, chaos some, in your mind there's some really cool neurobiological studies coming on this like okay. for example there's there's one with chronic pain where you can look at at the kind of how sensory motor information comes up into the brain and this kind of these heavy cognitive structures about how much pain I'm in, it's never going to go away. I'm not going to be able to live my life again. I'm never going to be, uh, you know, whole again. You know, my life is ruined, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Uh, or this kind of conceptualized self, you know, I, I'm only half of who I used to be. I, and uh, you can show that pain actually, uh, you know, projects out into parts of the brain that are involved in sense of self judgment predicting the future you have this very active default mode network you're, you're looking you're scanning you start doing the act stuff and it looks a little bit like very quickly like what you see in uh, contemplative practice mm -hmm. with the early data on psychedelics hmm. uh, the careful data the more recent ones not the woohoo sure. uh, 60s version okay and and what happens is th these 
needless connectivities start settling down. And people start feeling pain, even experimental pain. There's a study like this with chronic pain patients who then they have thumb screws put on them. And the pain goes up, but it doesn't produce this thing in your brain. It kind of just, you have access to it, you notice it, but it doesn't overwhelm, uh, uh, you know, the or your capacity to orient your right. attention towards what else is present and to the whole of your experience. I mean, even the thumbscrew is only one part of your experience. There's other things happening around you. So, so I think we're, we're, we're on the verge of really walking this thing out neurobiologically, not just psychologically. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, I, I love it. I love everything you're saying, Dr. Hayes. You mentioned something that perked my attention and got my attention, which was uh, you know, using psychedelics in a controlled setting. Uh, we've had Dr. Dennis McKenna on. We've had Rick Dobbin sure. on the show. Um, so, you know, I, I really want to know what your perspective is on this and using tools, medicines like ayahuasca for, you know, PTSD, when would you sure. recommend a person or a patient, um, go into, you know, that realm of addressing a problem and, you know, would you recommend it for everyone or is it for just some people? How do you address that? You know, I think a, a science, uh, a careful, cautious scientist, and I hope I can put that on, hat on, would look at the early trials and say, A, these are exciting. B, they're not yet fully determinative. C, we need more research. And uh, D, please <laughs> let's let re revisit the 70s and 60s. Absolutely. Yeah. We did that. You know, I mean, some of my best friends didn't make it out alive. Yeah. You know, I just don't want to do that again because unguided, it's just not. And it's not in any of our indigenous cultures unguided. None of them do it that way. Mm -hmm. So let's not Western folks just think, woohoo, you know, the, there's magic in the chemicals and it will speak to me. N no, that's <laughs> not really how the brain works. It's not how psychology works. And so ACT is being adopted by a number of the big centers, NYU, some other ones, as part of their randomized trials because they've made the determination, I think wisely, almost universally, that it's not wise to study these uh, chemicals in this new era just by here's the chemical put on the blindfolds period you know no sure. you yeah. need some sort of preparation guidance etc you don't have to dominate you know you can let the person go where they go but you have to have a guide a roadmap for that that, that is a kind of a psychological and scientific roadmap mm -hmm. and act really helps you with that because these six flexibility processes if I can spin around and name them, sure. of this kind of witnessing and observing sense of self instead of the storied, ego-based, evaluated sense of self that then allows you to notice your thoughts in flight without having them right up on your face dictating to you or you don't even notice that you're thinking, to open up to your feelings, your memories, your bodily sensations in a, in a flexible way, in an open way that's not needlessly squeezing down, eliminating information that your history and the current situation is giving you. And then to come into the present moment in a way that's flexible, fluid, and voluntary in terms of what you attend to. We're always in the now. What parts of the now should we be attending to? Should we broaden our view, narrow our view, shift our view, or, or stay focused? And let's let go of that tendency for the mind to say, you can only be in the now when you can ruminate enough that you can predict what's going to happen and worry enough that you can avoid some bad future. Let's show up here in the now and then connect with what brings meaning and purpose to us by choice, not wagging fingers of shame and blame or mama wanted me to do, do it or otherwise I'd feel guilty or no, the, none of those things predict progress in life. But I mean the kind where it's a leap of faith that I hold this dear and this is the kind of qualities I want to put into my behavior. And then good old-fashioned behavior therapy, build habits of values-based action. Take what we know about how to build behavior change in small increments, sometimes in large leaps. Some things like changing a job or getting married is a large leap thing. But you can well, you know, step up to that by learning how to develop competence in the way that you knew perfectly well how to do before language getting uh, got involved. When you as an infant, for example, spent hours and hours and hours and hours just trying to open a box or to reach a toy mm -hmm. or stand up on your two legs. 
Hmm. And now with the mind going, you want to suddenly spring forth from the head of Zeus and know things without any trial and error. Well, competency doesn't come that way. And so those are the six uh, processes. And if you can kind of bring them in, you know, life starts opening up. And going back even to this psychedelic piece, I think if we can use that as a guide, then we can look for, and we see it in the literature, and the early literature on psychedelics, that when you help people in that way about things that they might view of import, as importance, trips make a little more sense because people do find experiences of oneness and oceanic awareness, this sort of sense of self that connects us in consciousness to others. They notice their thinking, they're more open to their emotions, they're more flexible in their attention, and values sometimes lifelong values are coming out where people realize that they do care about the environment or living things or relationships and love or, you know, taking care of people who are suffering or whatever it is and the willingness to persist and to walk through what you need to do to build habits that are organized around that. So I, you know, I'm not here to sing the song of psychedelic therapy, but I'm really kind of pleased that some of the early trials that are going in that direction are using the flexibility skills that I walk through in a liberated mind deliberately. Mm. And they're at least saying that they find that the model really fits well to what the data show are the transformational qualities of those experiences when they do work well. I mean, well, I mean, there's, there's certainly something to be said about Western uh, psychology and its fa- Western medicine and its failure to really cure its patients. I mean, I've talked to people who have been on, you know, a litany of different medications for anxiety and and other problems, and and you know, like I I don't, you know, they end up you know, buying a ticket to go to the jungle for you know seven thousand dollars because they're just you know they've tried everything and nothing works, and they end up going and seeing the shaman, and it it really does you know help them. Um, so sure. it, it's it's amazing that organizations like Maps. And uh, people like uh, Dennis McKenna are, you know, studying this and putting out the research that we need to to make it, you know, a legal thing that we can do, aided by a doctor that's trained in it, instead of, you know, in your kitchen or in your living room by yourself, which we are not advising whatsoever. Yeah, well, a lot of what we're doing with the biomedicalization of human suffering and human pain, of selling this vision that really if you suffer, it's a disease. If you're in pain, it's a disease. If you're sad, it's a disease. If you're anxious, it's, it's, it's bull. It's not true. There's not a single, not one uh, syndrome, collections of signs and symptoms, that has turned into a disease. The last one was general paresis, which is untreated syphilis. And, and, and good academic psychiatrists will absolutely say yes to what the sentence I just said. And you can look at the DSM-5 workgroup document, Kupfer et al., who walks through it and says that in so many words, what I just said. Hmm. And so, and, and people like Alan Francis, the DSM-4 guy who's a, an endorser and blurber of, of a liberated mind. And, uh, you know, a good academic psychiatrist. Because what we're going to do instead, I think, what we need to do is, yes, take Western science, but walk into the processes of change that liberate human lives or, on the negative side, that walk lives into a restricted and a pathological space. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you you don't need the labels and the cubby holes and the five out of nines. And, you know, I I worry a little bit about the, you know, kind of... uh, some of the hype around some of the early psychedelic ones. And you know, if you look at, uh, you know, people like Baba Ramdas and so forth, you know, the old, uh, late, he's still the Dick Alpert, uh, people from that era who are saying, you know, they've walked down this kind of uh, contemplative practice road. Well, that's cool, but that's not the only way to get to some of these processes. And, you know, the, the person on the factory floor is probably not doing a 10-day silent retreat. That's just not happening. Hmm. I mean, even in the Eastern cultures where that happened, people were giving alms to the monks to do it. The normal folks weren't doing it. They Hmm. they were working. Mm -hmm. Well, can we take, out of respect, not out of disrespect, I'm not saying it's the same thing or it substitutes, but can we take something that we know scientifically as kind of a safe guide to uh, being able to create 
a more open and flexible way of being that walks your life forward in all these different areas. And what's exciting about the, the ACT work and psychological flexibility work is that if you learn the skills, let's say with anxiety, if you learn them with depression, if you learn them with substance abuse, you're going to find it's relevant to losing weight or it's relevant to keep into your exercise program or it's relevant when you have a diagnosis of cancer mm -hmm. or it's relevant when you're running your business or when you're trying to engage in high performance like competitive sports and you know in the book i walk through this i mean i literally have watched people win gold medals with act coaches mm -hmm. at the olympics mm -hmm. and so we have it's not that one size fits all because the techniques are different and every person's different but the human mind is not that complicated in the sense of what we need to do to at least get it bumped in the right direction mm -hmm. once you understand how it works and so I want to bring something into the culture. That's why I wrote this book. It's the first one that you, comprehensive act book you can kind of give to people without feeling as though you're either telling them they need a shrink or should be one. Mm -hmm. um, where you just walk through and say, holy beans, you know, everywhere, I, all these areas that are of importance to me, the science is saying there's some cool things I can do. And in the book, I try to walk through some learning exercises so people don't feel as though it's just blah, blah, blah. Here's the theory, blah, blah, blah. There's the data. Sure. No, you try it. Try it. Here's an exercise. Here's another exercise. Here's another exercise. And on the websites that support it and so forth, uh, if it's okay, I'll, I'll mention mine later. But yeah. you, know, you can get those tools and supports and stuff. And then all those other self-help books. I mean, there's 150 act books and several million copies floating around the world. <laughs> you know, you can dial into it once you get what the game is and that I don't want to say that that uh, substitutes for what we're trying to do with some of these more innovative things including what we're doing now finally I think properly by taking a serious look at psychedelics hmm. but I would say hold your horses be cautious mm -hmm. you know don't drink the Kool-Aid too quickly okay. uh, you know let's let's let the science move along and if you do do it at least look at uh, well, some of the, you'll find some of the folks who are doing that kind of thing are themselves adopting ACT as a method for their studies, and they must be doing it for some kind of reason. Maybe you should read about it and see if it's relevant to what you really want to have happen by that trip to the jungle. Mm. And um, that might be useful to you. Yeah. I can't say there's a piece of research on that, but I can tell you that the underlying processes have changed, and even what your neurobiology does – I'm writing a paper on this right now on psychedelics and what it, how they work and how they relate to what we know about how psychological flexibility works. Oh, I'd love to it see it. Really, really echoes. It looks really resonant. It looks like yeah, there's something in here that's worth chasing. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Hayes, it, I've got a couple different directions left to take this conversation, but since we're talking about ACT right now, there's a question from Kate, and she asks. Well, she says, "I'm loving the conversation." How do you see ACT growing in the next decade, or how do you hope to see it expand? Well, I'm really actively trying to do some things there, uh, and I'm really excited about where it's going. One is that, we're, you know, we've never been about just ACT, 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 you know, even our main scientific society that has about 8,500 members and 27 chapters around the world is called the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science. It isn't the Association for ACT. You know, act can come and go. The names come and go. Everything dies. Everything passes away. You know, I wear a little bracelet that says in Hebrew, this too shall pass, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, can we dig down to the processes? So that's one thing that I try to do in this book. But what has that, what has that allowed? Well, now at our conferences, we've got the compassion-focused therapy people. We've got the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy people. We've got the metacognitive therapist and the dialectical behavior therapist and the behavior analyst and all these, you know, the, the social workers and the biologists. And the other thing, I'm trying to put it inside an evolutionary frame because I really think here's what's going on. I mean, if you look at all of the life sciences, all of them except one, if you take any phenomena and you say, why is that like that? And then whatever answer the expert gives you, you say, well, why is that like that? And then whatever answer they give you, you say, well, why is that like that? By On average, three questions out, they're going to say the E word. 
they're going to say it evolved, and they're going to talk about why it evolved, mm -hmm. except one, the behavioral sciences. You can ask that question from now until next Tuesday. Nobody will ever say the E word. And I get that evolution sounds like the genes made me do it. It sounds reductionistic and, well, that's just only. But modern evolutionary thinking is looking at how variation, selection, retention in context at the right dimension and level moves systems forward. Businesses evolve, cultures evolve, people evolve. I mean, there's studies that's so exciting. There's a wonder that like a learning process, like classical conditioning, you know, here's a smell, there's a shock. Here's a smell, mm -hmm. there's a shock. Yeah. Let's say in a mouse model. Right. The pups of the pups of the mom that was exposed to that with oh. really good controls mm -hmm. startle to the smell. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So Lamarck is back. You know, there are things going on and I mean, literally, whether or not you know, how you relate to things might be based on the fact that your grandmother went through the Holocaust or that, you know, your mother was part of the Dutch winter cohort at the end of the Second World War or your grandmother and almost starved to death. And so what I'm trying to do is to take processes and then link them to a larger knowledge development journey that has been powerful in every area from economics. I mentioned uh, Lynn Ostrom. We've she won the Nobel Prize in, in economics 2009. Mm. And she, David Sloan Wilson, a major evolutionary biologist, myself and a psychologist in Australia named Paul Atkins, have created this method called pro-social, where we combine ACT with what Lynn won the Nobel for, which is showing that indigenous peoples can protect their forests, their lakes, their rivers, their streams. If you're hearing the climate crisis, you should can do that mm. without any government regulation and without private ownership, right. without an invisible hand and without command and control, but only if they organize their groups in a way that promote human cooperation. So where are we going? I, and it's in the last chapter of the book, I want to put these flexibility processes now scaled into the social processes and downwards to the biological processes that lift up human beings, connect them to others, and that empower us to step into the challenges of the modern world instead of shrinking and running away and fighting and hiding. And, you know, you can't turn on your television. Or you can't look at your cell phone without feeling like there's something really wrong in the world. No. And, you know, I think these psychological journeys people are interested in can be scaled into a social and cultural journey if we focus on processes and don't be so prideful about the names of methods and trademarking things and tithing to founders and all this nonsense that is a grasp at immortality. Mm -hmm. Instead, let's put processes of change in, into the world. And it, you know from reading the book, Xavier, I really try to Simplify it and put it out there in so many areas that you can come away and say, by golly, these processes are important. Mm -hmm. And maybe I should work on them. And maybe yeah. I should notice what my kids are doing. And maybe I should think about my church group. And maybe I should look at my business. And how am I actually fostering a values-based group inside my business or whatever it is that you're doing? And so that's the two things of joining and community with all the process-oriented kind of new wave therapies out there. And then leveraging that over into not just psychotherapy, don't put it in a little cul-de-sac like that, mm -hmm. but into human transformation, behavior change, growth, that we can scale even to the social problems that we either face or we're not going to have a world worth living in. Yeah, yeah, I agree with so much of everything you've said. And, um, you know, like I said in the pre-interview, in the conversation that we had briefly before the show started, um, I love the book. I ripped through it. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it usually, if I am struggling with moving through a book, it's because it's, it's a difficult read. And I, I didn't find that to be the case whatsoever with this book. And, and like I said, it's, you know, it's, it's like 300 pages. So, you know, just getting the book and holding it, I was just like, oh, man. <laughs> but, you know, I couldn't put it down. And I, gra I even grabbed a pen and I was just underlying. And, you know, that's a testament to, how much work there's such an immense work that you put into this research putting it together into this book it you know and and offering it to people 
um, in a usable, practical way that can affect you know their lives in in a measurable sense. Um, so, you know, I think people want science, but they don't want to be talked down to. They don't want to be lectured to. They don't want to have a finger wagging. You know, you, I, I would remind people, you know, that psychologists, their divorce rates are just about as bad as anybody else out there. Their suicide rates are actually a little higher. You know, be careful about all those experts and so forth. And well, one reason I wanted to write a really evidence-based book, but I think you'd agree it doesn't land that way. It doesn't really it, – it's evidence. It lands as though it's based – has that scientific heft to it. But I hope it doesn't ever feel like – and here's another study where 124 people were randomized. Like, a, you know, like, yeah. yeah, you know, I'll let my textbooks do that. I've written some books that are a cure for insomnia. I mean, it, even I can't read them, even though right. they're elegantly written, but they're just so arcane. You know, you're just painful almost to read the sentences. And I, I think sometimes we have a responsibility as the science folks. To step forward in a way that, to be frank, could I say something that sounds a little critical of other human beings? I understand the heart of it, but there's a whole lot of people out there saying things that they've learned by their personal experience and all of that, and there's basically no science behind it. Hmm. And the problem with it is there's too many voices. <laughs> and how do you pick them? Right. How do you know? Yeah. Next thing you know, the voices we're listening to are the commercial voices. <laughs> yeah. And they're the ones who are trying to sell stuff. Yeah. You know, if I can sell that you've got a latent disease, man, you've got to be on medications. You've got to be. But then you look at the long-term follow-ups and the side effects, and you're saying, wait a minute. I didn't used to hear the commercial for antidepressants with a warning that it could increase suicidality. I didn't. I don't remember that. No, because as the data has rolled along, you know, we find things out, and so I'm not saying there's not a role for antidepressants, sometimes so-called, that's a marketing term, but mm. those, you know, and properly done at a particular time. But be careful because people who are talking just about their own experience don't know how to simplify necessarily. And the people who are talking out of science that's contaminated by commercialism, sometimes there's other agendas. And so can we put something in there that's evidence-based and where consumers themselves can make the decision. And here's what I tell folks at the beginning of the book. I say, here's what you want. Does this help? Is there good evidence that it helps? Second, do you know why it works? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no to either one of those, this is not a method for you. And this book, I hope you'd agree, really walks through that we know something about how to create transformational change. And it's not the only thing that's going on, but man, psychological flexibility is a pretty powerful set. Mm -hmm. uh, the 20% that does the 80%. So uh, I hope I'm doing this in a way that is scientifically responsible on the one hand, at the same time as a good read and really empowers people. Yeah, I, I, I definitely so. think so. And I mean, there's many people in the chat that we have that have mentioned about, you know, because of this conversation, they're going to go and buy the book. And I highly recommend that you go and do that um you know, dr hayes i have one more question it's kind of sure. bugging me if i don't ask you then i'm gonna think later you know why didn't i ask him and then you'll probably end up getting an email from me like six months from now like dr hayes i didn't ask you this so you know i'm, I'm wondering about a little bit of a paradox that you know we're in as far as you know the larger picture the macrocosm of humanity and our connection to technology. I mean, you yourself in your book, you talk about how we are social beings and, you know, but, and, you know, there's this comparison belonging aspect to um, how we relate to other people. So, you know, with social media and technology and things like Facebook and Twitter, and when human beings are, yes, social animals, we're social creatures. And, you know, to quote you, even um, you say that just having a word for something is is a social act, right? So, yes, it is. so if you know, if it's the cooperative nature that that drives us, then and that can be useful. Then you know, like when I'm looking through my Instagram, for example, which is not often, I but it, it happens. But you know, and and I see, let's say, you know, someone that. I'm comparing myself to, you know, yeah. like, let's see, let's say that I see another podcaster and 
they're you know they, they have millions of followers and and I have this thought process that happened in my mind that it cr- is creating this comparison between me and this other person that I have no idea of like I don't know this person in real life whatsoever so yeah. I think that this happens often and oh, with man. other people in normal situations where you know they're just on their Instagram I mean maybe they're younger maybe they're in school and you know they're just flipping through social media and they experience this where it becomes this internalized judgment or self-reflection that is highly negative like what do you say about this what do you think about this boy you're you're just right on and one of the things i'd say is if we don't understand the processes we're moving around by this technology then we don't know how to put in our children's lives or in the lives or in the the things that we've created like you know our our school system or you know kind of our learning we don't know how to put things there you know and some of the folks that we need to reach are people yeah the podcasters yeah the, the 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 novel writers, the the cartoon makers, the songwriters, the you know we have many allies here, and you know our spiritual and religious traditions that know a lot, and so if we can take the science to focus on what needs to happen and put it out there, you know if you Google uh, my my son uh, his favorite cartoon is called the Stevens Universe, and uh, Google uh, here comes a thought. And it's this wonderful song that has been viewed on YouTube or whatever by the different versions, something like 20, 25 million times. And it it was a powerful line. Well, in the wiki site, uh, they even say this was based on act concepts. And actually, they tell me actually that it might even be so that Stephen wore a bald wig. I'm bald. You can't see it, but I am. Uh, In the – so – you know, somebody, I'm forgetting her name, or Sugar or something, something the songwriter, uh, saw something and put it into kids' lives. So we have allies here. We can work together, perhaps. And, I, you know, I see that in, in the attempts to put things in our movies for children and things like that. So the, the media, you know, that little computer in your pocket that's 120 million times more powerful than what landed, uh, you know, people on the moon. Right. And we're just looking at it to see what the Instagram post is. You know, it can do wonderful things. And if I can finish and just, uh, you know, you said the last question, do you have enough time to put a little yes. bit of a round about this? For okay. Sure. You know, what, what Lynn Ostrom won the Nobel for was showing that indigenous peoples can cooperate to protect their environment. The tragedy of the commons doesn't have to happen. But what David Sloan Wilson did in an article with Lynn before she died uh, my colleague David and I have written a couple books. She's a very close colleague, an evolutionary biologist at Binghamton. Is he showed that this follows the same principles of what's called multi-level selection, which is that higher levels of organization can be themselves selected, as long as the lower levels are taken care of but are not allowed to be selfish. Hmm. So, for example, you got 37 trillion cells in your body, right? Mm-hmm. Not counting the gut biome, which is way more than that. Mm -hmm. If any one of them says, hey, I just would like uh, more of me, eh, well, you've got the C word. And your body will detect the early transcription errors. It'll try to repair it. If it still won't behave, it'll try to kill the cell. If you have a functioning immune system, right? So the basic message there is we'll all work together. We'll all cooperate. You'll do pretty well, cell, because I'm going to feed you. You'll do a lot better than you would out on your own. But you can't be selfish. If you're selfish, I'm going to rein you back in. Try to do that little transcription correction. And if that's not adequate, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to set a phase out. Well, we have the same thing going on culturally. Right. And we have the same thing going on inside us, not just with cells. But when you talked about comparison, Mm -hmm. that's like a little part of you. You have that capability, right? And you want it. You want that part of you that can compare. Because if you're thinking through, how should I do this next podcast? You've got to be able to imagine a future that's never been. You haven't done the podcast and weigh it in your mind and pick a good route forward, right? Mm-hmm. So you want that capacity. But you don't want to feed that to the point that it starts eating the whole of you. Now you've got a psychological cancer. And so can you 
allow it to succeed, to be, be used where it's useful. All of these things, ego, you know, pushing away emotions, there are some circumstances. Let me give you one from the re research literature. Hmm. I was a little surprised when I first saw it because being open to your emotions is more helpful in almost every area of life. And then here comes this study. I mean, literally hundreds of studies. There's probably now... We're headed close to a thousand on experiential avoidance, our name for running away from emotions, sensations, and memories needlessly. And here comes this anomaly. Uh, ambulance drivers, while they're out on their drive, do better if when they get out of that ambulance, they can suppress their emotions. Well, of course. Mm -hmm. I don't want some my ambulance driver crying because there's brains on the street over here when this person over here might be saved. Yeah, yeah. So all of these little parts of us have a role. Can we treat them with kind of kindness and, and use them when they're useful and let them go when they're not, which is kind of like finding a way to help produce healthy cooperation. And then can we scale that same sense between you and your spouse, you and your spouse and your kids, your family and your neighborhood, your neighborhood and your city, your city and your state, your state and your country, your country and the world, you start thinking this way and everything gets global. Hmm. And don't we know that? If there's a, a climate crisis, dude, you can't sort of like draw some little imaginary thing and say, oh, this is the US of A. I mean, Come on, you know, right. your sky is darkening from what happened in the windstorm yeah. in, in the Middle East. Yeah. And, and the same thing with what we're seeing with violence and immigration and, you know, the clash between us religious traditions. And so here's my message is that let's take Western science to focus on these individual psychological processes, but then that are healthy, that are that essentially are like rules of engagement. How we can have a concaphony within, how we can have multiple cells, how we can have different parts of us and integrate them in a way that they all get to succeed, but only by cooperating. Mm -hmm. That dark mm -hmm. voice that wags its finger, I want sometimes, but I don't want to dominate in my life. <laughs> I did that, I know what happens, it's a train wreck. Everybody listening to me knows it. Because when you let that run, You've got like the psychological equivalent of cancer, yep. but it's the same thing with your relationships, your family, your community, your business. Can you find a way for your success to be embedded in the success of small groups and then in groups of groups and then in groups of groups of groups where the same rules apply? And that's the last chapter of the book, um, but it's sort of the spirit of the whole of the book. Mm -hmm. When we make those reads, when we can know how it works, man, we have so many more tools than just a, a lecture or, a, you know, something that our priest, minister, or rabbi might say to us or a mom. As important as that is, Western science has a role in producing and disseminating wisdom, too. And we're going to do it one little study at a time. And I hope people mm -hmm. find something in the book that is powerful and uplifting in that way. I really think they will. Dr. Hayes, we nailed this interview to the wall. I mean, I can't believe how much we got out of this conversation in just a little over an hour. And uh, just, you know, for my personal recommendation, I would highly recommend that you go and pick up this book. It's called A Liberated Mind, How to Pivot Toward What Matters. Uh, my guest is Dr. C Stephen C. Hayes. And Dr. Hayes, why don't you also give um, your website where people can find your work? How can they reach you? Are you are you on tour? Are you giving a big book tour or doing lectures or any of those things? I'm not yet on a book tour, uh, uh, but I'm uh, talking with uh, people who want me to talk. But I'm, you know, uh, if they go to stephenchayes.com, they can find things uh, of use. Um, uh, I'll send them a little seven item kind of uh, free thing of an act. If they don't even want that, they can go and go over to forward slash a hyphen liberated hyphen mind, all lowercase. And there's tools, there's things to give away, there's freebies. And you don't have to go in if you don't want to go into a, you know, like me capturing your email and blah, blah, blah. I don't spam people. But if you don't want to, just go there and I'll give you the freebies. And, uh, <laughs> 
including an awesome, I mean, an awesome book drawn by my 28-year-old uh, daughter. Uh, man, you got to see her depiction of the dictator within. I mean, you will you will not forget it. It's an awesome image. And um, so, uh, you know, but, but I do want to also say it's not all about me. ACT is out there. If you just put in psychological flexibility, experiential avoidance, ACT, you're going to find a vast network of people who are trying to put transformational processes into humans' lives one little database step at a time. And the reason we have a lot to say is we've been doing it for 40 years, mostly under the radar screen. Mm -hmm. But time's up. Uh, it's too important. And there's too many things happening in our culture. And so, um, you know, I'm stepping forward in the best way I can to let people know that there's something of use here. Not out of some arrogant, you know, uh, me, me, me way, but, but in a way that is just a little flashlight on, here's something that might be useful. Check it out. Try it out. And very quickly, you may sense, ah, there's something in there for me. And if so, there's a lot of supports out there from uh, my website on down. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Hayes, stick with me while I do this close for me for a second. Guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Uh, once again, the book is called A Liberated Mind. My guest, Dr. Stephen C. Hayes. This was such a phenomenal episode. Wow. Uh, usually, what we do after the episodes is we have a Discord server. It's just a community server that we run. And so if you're, if you're listening to this and you made it through the end and you're listening to my voice right now, you can find that link in the description of this video and you can get over to that area of our community and I will be in there. We'll discuss how the episode went. But uh, guys, that's going to do it for us here at HXP. We will be back for you next week. Or sorry, not next week. We actually have, have an interview tomorrow night. Uh, we have a double header this week. We'll have Dr. Daniel Amen on the show tomorrow night. So hopefully you tune in for that. And um, if you're listening to this via po the podcast version, please get over to iTunes. Leave us a review, positive or negative. It really helps us stay relevant. Uh, one of the things that I hear a lot is people, when they hear the show, they they have no idea they that we existed and they're just wondering how we have such amazing guests and such amazing content and they're only just finding out about it now. So that's probably the biggest compliment that you can give us is just by sharing our work with your friends and your family. Thank you guys so much for listening and being here. Without your presence, this would not be possible. We are going to get out of here. See you tomorrow, tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you so much.